Hi, and welcome to this second of a three-part video on the 123 block project. Now you may have noticed that I have been calling it the 123 block project even if it's a metric project. Maybe I should be calling it the 25 by 50 by 75 block, but that's a little too long. At the end of the first video, we just completed the positioning and center drilling of the eight holes on the primary surface. That's important because now we're going to move on to the drill press to complete those holes. And those center drilled holes that we've already produced are going to guide our finished drills or finished size drills to their proper positions on the part. However, if you're in no particular rush because we're going to the drill press because we need to show how to use the drill press and also because we have several students in the class who need the mill, so we'll free up the mill by using the drill press. But if that's not the case and you have access to your own mill, well you could very well drill all those holes with the same setup that we used at the end of the first video. So let's get over to the drill press and get on with this project. We're going to start with a good cleanup. Remember, in this area of work, cleanliness equals precision. Dirt or chips jammed between a part and a vise, or between the vise and the work table, means parts that aren't properly positioned. We're going to use parallels here to lift the part from the bottom of the vise, and that way we'll be able to drill through the part without damaging the vise. Push down on the part when tightening the vise. Try to get it as well seated as possible against the parallels, but don't get upset if the parallels stay a little loose. We don't want to use a dead blow hammer. The base of this vise is in grey cast iron and will probably break if we hit it too hard. For most drilling operations, the drill press vise is free floating, so we need a pin of some sort against which we can lean the drill press vise so that it doesn't rotate should the drill jam in the hole, because a rotating vise is very dangerous. The tolerance on the two first holes we're going to drill, the 11 millimeter holes, isn't very tight, so we're going to go directly to an 11 millimeter drill. No reaming required for these holes. For this size of drill and this type of material, we're going to want about 400 RPM. Then set your depth stop to make certain that the end of the drill just makes it through the part. After all, we want to make certain that we don't drill into the drill press vise, but we're also going to use it for safety because we want to have a good idea of when the point of the drill is going to come out of the other end of the part, because that's when the drill is most likely to snag in the hole. We can now disactivate our emergency stop button, start the machine, and align the drill with our center drilled hole. Once everything's in line, we can start to drill. Notice how I'm holding the vise. Don't position any fingers between the vise and the pin that's going to stop its rotation should it jam. That could become very painful. When cutting deep holes in tough steel, like this 4140 steel, use a peck drilling technique. That means drill retract, drill retract, and do it often. Cool the tool down regularly with a good water-based cutting fluid. Cooling down the part is nice, but it's the tool that really needs to be cooled down here. To reduce the amount of friction, retract and engage the tool rapidly. Remember, we set the depth stop earlier to indicate to us the point at which we're going to pass through the bottom of the hole. So when the depth stop gets close to bottoming out, ease up on the feed. Once you've completed the two 11 millimeter holes, we can change the drill for an 8.5 millimeter drill and produce the six other holes to be done on this primary surface. Don't forget to readjust your depth stop for this second size of drill, since the length of jobber drills vary proportionally to their diameter. The smaller the diameter of the drill, the shorter it becomes. Don't forget to peg drill and don't forget to cool down the tool, and especially don't forget to ease up on the feed when you come out the bottom side. And there, our eight holes on our primary surface are complete. So we can now move on to the chamfering operation. 
Chamfering tools are form cutting tools and as we've mentioned before, form cutting tools require slower RPM. That's why we're going to change to our bench type drill press. Since it has a double belt setup for speed adjustment, we can set it at speeds lower than 100 RPM. With the tool leaning in one of the 8.5 millimeter holes, we can set the first depth adjustment nut on the depth stop of the drill press and then back it off by one half turn. Holding that first nut in position, we can then come down on it with the locking nut for the depth stop and lock it in position. This technique will give us an even depth of chamfer on all the 8.5 holes, but if we apply the same logic to the 11 millimeter holes, they'll end up with the same depth of chamfer as well. In other words, all our holes, regardless of their diameter, will have a one half turn depth of chamfer. And when all the holes, regardless of their diameter, have the same depth of chamfer, well, our part looks pretty good. Complete the six chamfers on the 8.5 millimeter holes. But before we move on to our 11 millimeter holes and change our chamfer depth, we're going to flip the part over and do the six chamfers on the other primary surface. This will save us a couple of setups and in reality it'll speed up our work. Remember when you flip the block over, keep everything really clean. Note here that I'm not leaning the drill press vise up against a pin, and the reason is simple. A chamfering tool never actually is a prisoner of its own hole, so there's no way that you can jam a chamfering tool in a hole, and that's why I'm not worried of snagging the part. So I've completed my 12 chamfers on my 8.5 millimeter holes. I can now move on to the 11 millimeter holes. As you can see, I'm using the same technique and I'm still going to back off by one half turn. Remember, that'll maintain a certain constant on our chamfer depth, regardless of the diameter of the hole. Once I've completed my two chamfers on my 11 millimeter holes on this side of the part, I can flip it over without changing any depth settings and do the two holes on the other side. And there you have it, 16 chamfered holes, chamfered at a constant depth regardless of their hole diameter. Exactly the kind of attention to detail you'd expect from a professional craftsperson. Okay, so you've probably noticed that I haven't drilled all the holes on this surface of the part. I omitted drilling the three holes on this secondary surface. And the reason is quite simple. I don't have to complete this project. It's only a demonstration. For you, however, it's going to be quite important since you're completing the project to produce the three holes on this secondary surface. It is crucial, however, that you produce these three holes first off. It's very important to say that when we're producing holes that are going to intersect other holes in the part, it's important to produce the longest holes first. It's also generally accepted that when drilling intersecting holes, we produce the largest of the two holes first. That permits the smallest of the two drills to pass through the larger hole that it's intersecting without grabbing on the edges of the existing hole. So it's important to produce the three holes on the secondary surface before producing the eight holes on the primary surface. This machine is a radial arm drill press. It's called a radial arm drill press because it has an arm that moves radially around the column. The drill press's head can be moved along the radial arm and that permits us to position the head above the workpiece rather than moving the workpiece. The radial arm assembly can be moved up and down the column, but be careful, this isn't a feed. It's only to be used to position the head. This is a powerful drill press and for that reason we're going to be bolting the vise down solidly and using a rigid milling machine type vise. Since there's no XY axis on this type of machine, vise alignment isn't important. But line it up visually just the same. 
because a crooked vise really gives me cramps. The floating head can be positioned anywhere above the table. In this case, we're going to be using the positioning tenon on the end of a counterboring tool to position the tool directly above the 11 millimeter holes that we produced earlier. Obviously, since the tool's tenon guides itself in the hole and the tool is going to be in rotation, make sure that it fits freely in the hole before you start this operation. We don't want any leftover chips from a previous operation to skew our positioning, so make certain everything's clean. We're going to be using two parallels to raise the part in the vise. This will position our primary surface above the vise jaws. That'll help us a great deal when we move the tool for our measuring operations. In other words, we won't have to worry about hitting the vise jaws with the tool's tenon. This form cutting tool requires slow speeds, so set your RPM to about 60. Then, using the radial arm and the floating head, position the tool's tenon into one of the 11 millimeter holes. Once in position, make certain that you lock the floating head on the arm and that you lock the arm onto the column. We don't want things moving around here. You can now start cutting, but be careful. Huge amounts of pressure are required to perform this operation. If you don't have a radial arm drill press, well, I'd suggest that you use a good vertical milling machine. But use your z-axis to feed the part into the tool rather than using the quill that in many cases just wouldn't be able to take this kind of pressure. As I've said, a lot of force is required for this cutting action, so cool the tool down regularly because force equals heat when cutting. Once the tool is well engaged into the part, you can unlock the radial arm and only the radial arm. This will permit you to swing the tool out of the way and clear the work surface without losing your position in both planes. And now we have some room for measuring. Since we're just starting out in the shop, we're going to use the slowest but safest measuring technique. And that is the cut, measure, cut, measure and do it often technique and we're going to continue cutting and measuring until we get to the depth that we want for this counterbore. Bring the radial arm back to its position, lock it in place and continue on machining. When your first counterbore is complete, we can move on to the second counterbore and redo the same series of operations. So there you go, our counterbores are complete. We can now pull apart from the vise, and whatever you do, don't go and produce two counterbores on the second primary surface, because only one of the two surfaces incorporate counterbores. All that's left now is deburring the counterbores. Note that if you use a handheld deburring tool, fix the part in a bench vise and use both hands on the tool. That way you can avoid cutting yourself. For tapping the holes, we're going to need an M10 by 1.5 taper tap and an M10 by 1.5 bottoming tap. A plug tap won't be required for this project. We're also going to need a good quality tapping oil because this steel is tough stuff. We're going to start with our taper tap and we're going to insert it into a tap handle. On the tip of the taper tap, we're going to put a few drops of tapping oil. As the name suggests, taper taps have large tapers on their ends, and this helps the insertion of the tool into the part. They're easier to start as well. We want to engage it by about one full turn, or just enough so that the tap holds on its own. We can then remove the tap handle and verify the tap's alignment using the head of an adjustable square. Verify at two points, spaced by approximately 90 degrees. I can now reinstall the tap handle and turn the tap approximately one more turn, adjusting its alignment as I go. Once that I'm satisfied with the tool's alignment, I can continue tapping, but I'm going to use a back and forth motion. These hand taps have straight flutes, and that means that the chips are going to curl up onto themselves. 
if we don't want them to block the flutes of the tool and jam the tool in the part, we're going to want to break them. And for that, we're going to go forward and back about a quarter turn each time. This produces short chips that can easily fall through the flutes. After four or five complete turns, I can retract the tool, clear the chips that are stuck in the flutes, reapply a small amount of tapping oil, and carry on with the operation. Since the tapered end of a taper tap doesn't produce a full thread, and since this part is about the same thickness as the threaded portion of these taps, I'm going to follow the taper tap with a bottoming tap. Although they are the same size of thread, bottoming taps have full threads almost to the very end of the tap, and that should allow us to produce a full thread right through this part. So I can feel a slight resistance here just towards the bottom of this thread. So that's a good indication that we didn't have a full thread all the way through. There you go. No more resistance. I'm through the part. This hole is threaded. And since these holes were previously chamfered, the hole is complete as it is. No more operations are required. That first alignment technique was pretty labor intensive. Now, a second way of aligning a tap would be to use a guide block. If you find a block or make a block that incorporates a hole that's just slightly larger than the tap you're using, well, you can use that block to align your tap. And for that, you're still going to use the taper tap with a little bit of oil, but this time you're going to engage the tool into the part through the guide block. Holding the guide block firmly against your workpiece, engage the tool by about three full turns. When you can feel that your tool is well and solidly engaged into the workpiece, we can remove the tap handle, remove the guide block, and complete this tap hole in the same way that we completed the first tap hole. And there you go, two tapping techniques and two tap holes. Continue on with the four other M10 by 1.5 holes before moving on to the stamping operation. For the identification, we're going to use a small size ball peen hammer and one eighth of an inch high letter punches. We're going to identify our part with our part number between two of the tapped M10 by 1.5 holes on the side of the part that isn't counterboard. This first stamping is done with a small ball peen hammer because it needs to be very light. I'm going to use this first stamping to position my letters properly. If it is just lightly stamped and one of the letters isn't well positioned, I can fix it. Because a lightly punched but poorly positioned number will be erased by the final grinding. Once that you're satisfied with the positioning of the numbers, we can move on to a larger ball peen hammer and produce a much deeper indentation. It's important here not to swing the ball peen hammer. You want to hold the hammer handle horizontally and let the head of the hammer fall in a straight line onto the punch. It's really the weight of the hammer that makes the indentation. This reduces the possibility of hitting the punch at an angle. If you hit the punch at an angle, it will probably become a projectile. That being said, it's always a good idea to keep your mouth closed when you're punching holes, because more than one person has lost a tooth during a punching operation. This applies to the person punching, but also to any spectators around. Punching produces mushrooming around the letters, so make sure to remove it with a file. To ensure maximum penetration of the numbers, repunch and refile a second time. So let's check. I have two counterboard holes, six threaded holes, and my part is properly identified. It's important to check because we can't come back on it once the part is heat treated. So let's move on to the heat treating room. 
With our heat treatment oven preheated to 1550 degrees Fahrenheit and using a pair of appropriate tongs and protective gloves, we can position the part in the back half of the oven towards its center, tertiary surface towards the bottom and primary surfaces towards the sides. The part is going to have to stay in the oven for about a half an hour, so now is the time to prepare for its extraction. Make sure you have everything ready in advance. Once the part reaches its proper temperature, you can pull it from the oven. Get someone to help you, because the sequence of operation here must be done quickly and cannot be interrupted. Everything has to follow in order, so make certain that your tampering oven is preheated and ready to receive the part. We want it to be around 550 degrees Fahrenheit. To ensure an even cooling of the part and to avoid the formation of gas bubbles on any one surface, keep the part moving in a slow figure 8 style. After about 20 seconds, you want to verify sporadically the state of the part. You want to pull it from the oil when it's around 400 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you prefer, when it is just producing a very light or small amount of smoke. When you can just barely see the smoke, pull the part from the oil and let it drip for about 5 seconds. Then, promptly deposit it on the absorbent paper that you've laid out earlier. Everything here has to be done quickly. Without wasting any time, remove all the excessive oil that you can quickly. Be careful, remember the part is still around 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Once roughly cleaned up, and again without wasting any time, we rapidly insert the part into the tempering oven. The part will have to sit in that tempering oven for at least 40 minutes. The positioning of the part in this oven is not particularly important. Once the tempering operation complete, you can pull the part from the tempering oven and deposit it on a refractory brick so that it can return to the ambient temperature slowly. So there you have it. Our rough machining is complete and our part is heat treated. If you remember what it looked like when it came out of the tempering oven, well you know that the part looked pretty rough. And that is why we left a small amount of material on each external surface for finishing. So the subject of our next third and final video of this 1-2-3 block video series is going to be on grinding. See you then. and. Happy machining.